Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sankhang namasami Number of uh, different uh, things kind of floating through, uh, through in, floating through my mind uh, tonight about what to talk about. Um, not sure exactly how they'll all pull together if they do, but uh, if they don't. I guess that's okay too. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've been, as we all know, uh, talking about the four protective. Uh, meditations throughout the retreat, and I think uh, one that was kind of coming to mind uh, more recently is the reflections on uh, uh, metta bhavana, the development of loving kindness. Ajnanako did a, uh, several days of, of readings uh, around that, which I found very, very enjoyable. Uh, some really good readings, particularly from Ajahn Sona's uh, book, Bloom. Um, just uh, good stuff, good stuff. <clears throat> and uh, interesting how actually very little of it was spent around uh, the mechanics of it as a reflection, uh, but more just uh, the qualities uh, of reflection on uh, metta and how it can uh, expand our mind uh, and soften our experience. And how that plays out on uh, so many uh, different levels, uh, individually, collectively. And uh, the quality of uh, metta, kindness, uh, goodwill, uh, and how it is so much an important part of self-effacement, letting go of the constraints of uh, holding tightly to a perception of, of self, I, me, mine, <clears throat> and the power that cultivation of any of the Brahma Viharas, really, in, 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 as well as other uh, skillful mind states, but metta in this instance, uh, how, how much uh, it can allay that constricted sense of being, of being someone, being me. <clears throat> and, and it also uh, is a great framework or a way of being in community, uh, in our various communities that we're in, whether it's here at the monastery or in our home life, at our work, workplace, wherever we find ourselves in, in groups of people who uh, need to interact and be with each other and, and be together, live together, work together. And how skillful it is and, and how um, easeful it is uh, when we're operating with that characteristic uh, in mind and developing that quality as the basis for being with each other. Of course, what comes to mind is the, uh, the wonderful sutta on um, the three monks living together harmoniously. The Buddha, in his wanderings, comes across three monks living and practicing together. Anuruddha, Nandiya, Kim, Kimbila, and asks them how are they faring? How, how are they getting along with their practice? And they report that they're doing actually quite well. Uh, and 
practicing quite well together. And the Buddha says, well, how, how, how's, that, how's that happening? And the response from all three of them uh, is that, is that um, they are uh, living harmoniously, blending together like milk and water, viewing each other with kindly eyes. And that the way they do that, and the Buddha further questions, well, how's that, how's that happening? I think, he, I think this was on the heels of coming from the, the quarrel at Kosambi. Uh, but uh, even if it wasn't, it, uh, the Buddha was wondering, you know, like, oh, this is really nice to see. How's, that, <laughs> how's this happening? And uh, they answer that uh, basically they are, um, whether it's a, acts of uh, body, speech, or mind, that they uh, practice uh, with loving kindness towards each other. They uh, act, in, uh, act in ways with loving kindness, uh, speak in ways with loving kindness, and uh, try and direct their thoughts towards each other with metta. And whatever, they also continue with uh, expressing that uh, uh, they try and have an attitude of, of um, I just, you know, whatever it is that I want to do, I, I set that aside and do what my venerable friends would like to do. Why shouldn't, I, why shouldn't I set aside what it is that I want to do and do what these others would like to do? So you imagine three people living together doing that. Yeah, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing if we all did that. Um, what a, what a different world it would be. It's so hard to override that sense of, I want to do what I want to do. I, I, I remember a story that I heard in a talk from Ajahn Suchito on a, on a recording that uh, a, a, a woman, a friend, uh, one of the students of his was uh, talking about her two-year-old daughter who, whose favorite phrase uh, was becoming, but mommy, I want to do what I want to do. And uh, thus begins the whole emergence of dukkha. But these venerables are practicing with setting aside what it is that they want to do and doing what others would like. So this is very tall practice. And then even more so, um, uh, they remark that uh, they are, uh, even though they are uh, three in body or different in body, they are one in mind, which is quite amazing uh, thing to, to say as well. Uh, it's uh, quite wonderful that recognizing that we have our individual differences, our individual existences in a way, but uh, we have in common uh, a very similar set of values in mind. So this is a, a great way to aspire to express our loving kindness within the context of our, our communities that we're living in. And it's so easy to get caught in um, things like uh, opinions and views and uh, criticisms and, and ways we try and get done what we feel needs to get done. Uh, and uh, it's so easy to get wrapped up in, in, in uh, doing things the way that uh, we feel that they need to be done, or uh, getting upset when other people do things in a different way that we think uh, should be done, or um, have a different set of values from, from ourselves and how to, to skillfully work with those uh, to really develop that sense of, of kindness in action, metta in, in practice, metta in community. I think one of, one of the things that uh, can happen in various uh, groupings, whether it's at work or in monasteries, is, is um, Kind of developing cliques or factions of people, you know, who have similar ideas, 
Um, you know, we always gravitate. Of course, we you know, naturally gravitate to, to people who share similar uh, ideas or thoughts or, or ways of practice or ways of being. And, but um, it can become uh, hazardous, uh, like in a workplace, for instance, too, where, where uh, people gravitate towards each other and then start um, living or uh, acting or communicating uh, uh, in groups that are in opposition, opposition to each other. This is like what happened at the quarrel at Kosambi. And um, I think, you know, boy, uh, here at Abayagiri, we've been pretty fortunate uh, to avoid that in any kind of major ways. And, and, but that takes work. That takes um, recognition of the, uh, the possibility and the tendency to do that, whether it's along what's happening, lines of what's happening um, in the work world or in the monastery, or whether it's more around social or political issues, um, just to be uh, very sensitive to not letting that happen. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think we've been really fortunate here in, in uh, being sensitive to that kind of uh, issue and, and uh, the closeness of our community. Um, and uh, keeping that in mind has, has kept things uh, quite good for, for many years. So uh, kudos for, for that and just, uh, you know, it, but it does take uh, recognition and management uh, and prevention. Or if we find ourselves sometimes, um, you know, getting involved, and I think everybody can experience this at some time, criticizing other people for things not going right, or somebody who's got some annoying habit um, that uh, doesn't seem good or skillful or, uh, or uh, pleasant even to be around, um, how easy it is to get into uh, finding someone to, to vent to and, and uh, talk about and commiserate with and get some reality check or validation. And it's, it's not to say that we, we shouldn't ever do anything like that, particularly if it's from the intention of wanting to understand or see what our own motivations might be uh, involved uh, in that kind of situation. And looking to get some insight and, and uh, uh, strategy um, uh, to work with. So it's not that we shouldn't ever kind of find someone to talk about uh, our issues with, somebody that we have issues with, uh, and get some perspective. Um, but to be careful about uh, how that's held and where that can lead. Uh, and uh, is it just reinforcing uh, the tension rather than um, providing a solution? So it's all in how we handle it. And it brings to mind, uh, uh, before I was a monk uh, and working in a, a healthcare setting uh, with a number of other people, but three of us who ended up uh, working fairly closely together, and this was over a fairly long period of time, number of years, really. Um, and. Uh, uh, had a very, you know, generally a good working relationship with each other, the three of us. Um, not always blending together like milk and water, but uh, sometimes uh, getting along those lines. But two of us in particular uh, uh, got along quite well and, and uh, would often experience similar frustrations uh, with the other person and uh, would, you know, disagree with an approach or find some sort of irritating quality or uh, uh, yeah, along those lines. And, and of course, then the two of us would get together and grouse, kind of uh, complain and, and moan and, and uh, reinforce each other uh, around that. And after a while of doing that, I think, I'm not sure whether it was the other person or myself, but it dawned on, on one of us that maybe this wasn't so skillful and it wasn't really helping a whole lot. Um, so we kind of did some strategizing and, and decided that uh, if we found each other doing that, um, uh, making some sort of complaint or criticism about this other person, 
um, then the other person would try and catch it, listen and support whatever needed to be done. But then also the, the agreement was is that uh, whoever it was that was uh, issuing the complaint uh, would then have to come up with two qualities uh, of that other person, that third person, uh, that were worthy of appreciation. So uh, it was always, a, and we found that that was actually quite good at kind of dispelling the, uh, the irritable feeling, irritable feeling um, or the kind of categorization of, of that person, the, uh, putting them in a pigeoning, pigeoning hole, pigeonholing them in, into a, a certain uh, typecast perception. And, you know, it also ended up being that we found that uh, throughout the day, um, if you're finding yourself kind of feeling a bit irritated and you knew you were going to be talking about it, you also had to kind of start looking for a couple of other things that were worthy of, uh, of appreciation <laughs> because you knew you were going to have to come up with them uh, in, in later on. So that uh, just created a whole different way of uh, viewing, uh, viewing someone. Uh, that uh, if you have to go around looking for their good qualities uh, all the time, then uh, the things that you would have considered bad qualities or difficult ones uh, start to become less important and much more balanced. So I, I recommend that as a, uh, as a uh, kind of an antidote to uh, complaining and griping about uh, somebody. That's another way of uh, expanding ourselves, expanding our narrow view of, of, of ourselves. Um, we can get so constricted around things like uh, critical nature or uh, tightness uh, around ourselves or around other people, especially around ourselves, that uh, the quality of uh, relaxation and opening and uh, expanding ourselves with, with kindness uh, just provide, provide such an uh, open, um, much more relaxed state of being, a less self-constricted uh, kind of way of being in the world. Much more sublime abiding, divine abiding, to not be so honed in on uh, a very narrow, um, small state of mind. It gets very uptight, constricted, particularly in meditation, if, if things start to come up like that. How narrow and how cramped uh, we can feel sometimes when we're involved in our own, own little worlds. And how important it is to just, when that happens too, to work on just taking ourselves a little bit less seriously. We can see our poor qualities, and if we can uh, develop a sense of more expansiveness, uh, if not metta uh, for ourselves, maybe at least patience. It's another one of those wonderful mind-expanding, uh, self-effacing states of mind that can, that can hold a lot. Uh, and if we can see ourselves in our foibles uh, with a bit of humor and a bit of patience, uh, then that constricted sense of self uh, relaxes. So I think of, we don't often think of uh, metta bhavana as part of the process of uh, establishing a perception or realizing uh, uh, how it is that uh, we uh, form a sense of self, a perception of self. Uh, but I think it's uh, one tool of, of many. Uh, it's part of the process of, of uh, readjusting our perception of, of self and establishing perception of, of not self. Uh, this kind of expanding of what it is that we consider to be our, our sphere of experience, our point of reference. So yeah, I think, it, uh, I think of it as metta, it's a, one of these protective contemplations, and it, it protects us from just imploding uh, into a 
very narrow existence. Uh, and it uh, protects our communities that we live in uh, from uh, division and, and conflict. Uh, and just makes, well, it's the, really the, the lubricant of life. Uh, it makes it just a much more uh, doable uh, place to be here in Sangsara. And it provides a, a basis, I think, uh, for realization of uh, deeper levels of uh, realizing the perception characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta um, allows us the, the space to uh, e explore and, and examine the subtle ways that we uh, cling to a, a sense of, of uh, personality, identity, uh, and how to start uh, relaxing even more uh, and releasing around uh, that perception. You know, when you get a little bit of space around it, it, it opens up the door for, for the exploration of well, how, how is it that I got here anyway? You know, what is it that, why is it that I've, you know, established this uh, very strong perception of self, of me, of mine? Uh, what, what, what is the basis for this? Uh, how has it come? How has it come to be? Uh, what is it? What is this uh, whole thing of uh, a perception or a sense of self? And there's this wonderful teaching many of people are familiar with, the um, um, Majjhima Nikaya number forty-four, with uh, Visaka the layman uh, questioning uh, the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina, and one of the um, series of questions is around this personality view, and he asks her, you know, what, it, you know, how how does this come to be? You know, uh, this this personality view, this I am uh, perception, and her answer is, um, well, when one assumes uh, any form of self around uh, the body form. Uh, any sense of uh, self, whether it's uh, I am this body, or I am in this body, or this body is mine, or uh, you know, possession of the body, or the body uh, possessed by self. Um, any of the various w different ways that one can uh, establish uh, a perception of self around the body, um, this, is, uh, this is how uh, the whole sense of, of I am comes to be, or in relation to feelings, um, uh, perceptions, volitions, mental, qual mental volitions, and uh, consciousness. Uh, any way that one establishes a sense of I am, or me, or mine, uh, around any of the five khandhas, uh, then either individually or uh, collectively uh, is the basis for this uh, perception, this development of, uh, of personality view, uh, the Sakaya Ditti, uh, the view that establishes identity in any of these five khandhas or altogether. So that's how it comes to be. And then he further asks, well, what is the, you know, what's the origin of that? Where does, uh, where does, the, where does the drive, essentially, uh, come from? To, to establish those views, to pick up those views uh, in relation to the five khandhas. And uh, her answer uh, is uh, essentially it's, it's the drive, the force of, of bhava tanha, the, the craving for becoming, the craving for being. It's this root cause. Uh, it's this momentum of mind towards existence. Uh, uh, that uh, then creates the force to establish identity around uh, the five khandhas. So I, you know, rereading that over and over again, and just rereading it fairly recently, just 
uh, pondering myself, well, you know, how, how is it that in relation to each of these five, five khandhas, that this force, this bhavatanha, this uh, wish to be, how is it, how is it that um, we use the five khandhas to, to, to establish that? You know, what is it within each of these five aggregates that we call ourselves, or the five aggregates of, of experience, body and mind, um, what is it that we that we seek out or find in in these uh, five khandhas that lead to that um, sense of, of of being, that sense of becoming, and and just reflecting a bit, at least from my own experience, how uh, it, when I do that with with the body, uh, it gives me a sense of of location, of presence, of place. Um, that uh, feels quite real, feels quite tangible. You know, if I am my body, or if I act in a way that's uh, uh, supportive of, of that establishment of identity around, uh, around the body, then it, it makes me feel solid. It makes me feel present. It makes me feel grounded. Um, ah, this is, you know, this is me. It's a, it's a good... It's a, it's a location, it's where I am, it's a sense of, uh, you know, existence, presence, solidity. And with feelings, if, um, you know, uh, how do I establish, you know, what is driving me to establish a sense of uh, identity around, uh, around uh, the feeling aggregate? And you can see that the, the pursuit of pleasant feeling, if we're successful with that, if we get what we want that brings us a pleasant experience in the sense realm, then there's a feeling of, of um, being able to control. You know, we have we've success, it's, it, and it's very reinforcing. We get what we want, and it reinforces that sense of somebody there who can do that. I, oh, I was able to get what I want. Well, maybe I'll be able to do it again. <laughs> And that's almost kind of like uh, you know, the basis, I think, for addiction. Uh, there's a slight empowerment of uh, the sense of self that comes when you get what you want. Let's see if I can replicate that. Or with perceptions, you know, the world is full of stimulation and contact through the sixth sense bases. Uh, all the sights and sounds and sensations uh, and thoughts that come through our, our mind, um, they bombard us and, and they're almost dizzying in, in the complexity uh, and volume uh, that we can experience them with. And our perceptions are a way of narrowing that to, to uh, so that we don't go crazy, really. Uh, we don't go insane with overstimulation. We uh, categorize things, experiences, um, we selectively see what we want to see uh, according to our own uh, habits and patterns and desires as a way of, of, of controlling our experience of the world so that it's not just a mass bunch of chaos. And we do that uh, in our perceptual world, perceptual world with other people too. It's easier to categorize somebody as a certain personality type or certain traits uh, and then operate in relationship to them uh, with, that, uh, with that perception in mind than it is to be uh, open to all the various ways that somebody can be. Uh, and so based on our own prejudices, our own beliefs, um, and with that wish to uh, be able to, again, control, um, to control our experience in, in an understandable secure, predictable way, uh, we form all of these perceptions to just uh, simplify our world in a sense. And then the, the uh, sankharas, the, the volitions, the, these are the, the great impulses that uh, Ajahn Jeff refers to it as like the, it's sort of the, the producer aspect of the, of the I am, of the conceit I am. It's the producing aspect. It's, 
that's really where we think uh, that we can uh, have a sense of control is if we um, you know, fabricate. That's the process of, uh, of sankaras is, is, is fabrication. If uh, that sense of I can do this, I can create my own reality uh, by uh, thinking it into existence, uh, by acting on something, uh, body, speech, or mind, um, by speaking uh, in a certain way or coming up with some sort of uh, formation, fabrication, um, then if, if we're successful, uh, uh, we've established ourselves with another perception. Uh, we've created something and it gives us this, our sense of, of control. I can, I can uh, direct uh, with will, uh, with volition, uh, the world around me. And of course, you know, we, we can use the um, factors of, of volition uh, based on uh, our contact with the world to, to generate a thought, to generate a um, certain kind of action in our, in, our, uh, in our world. And because we can do that to a little bit of an extent, we form an identity around it and, and kind of operate as if, we, if, as if there is someone here who has ultimate control. And of course, what we find is that it's, it's a limited form of control and that we actually don't have ultimate control over our bodies and, and our minds. Uh, they follow certain laws of nature uh, and uh, we're only fooled by this uh, volition, this ability to form an intention that feels really like me uh, to, um, to, to choose where we uh, put our attention and develop our experience along those lines. It, it, but it gives a false sense of uh, me-ness, I-ness. But it's enough to keep us doing it and it gives us a sense of temporary security anyway. And consciousness, how we uh, weave a sense of continuity um, that gives us a, a sense of security um, through uh, rapid moving between all of the sense bases uh, to, to create that, as it's you know, referred to, that magician's illusion um, of continuity of experience that uh, helps uh, control the chaotic nature, really, of, of uh, the stimulation that can come in through all of the six senses. So we've established this pattern of how to, to weave a sense of uh, uh, an illusion of continuity. So this is how, at least in my considerations, that we weave this, uh, this is why, this is the motivation. It's basically coming down to this wish to uh, control and uh, feel secure uh, in the realm of samsara, in the realm of experience. This is our motivation for establishing a perception of self and believing in it. What a lot of work <laughs> it takes to, to keep this up. You know, the, the amount of energy and effort that we just constantly engage in to, uh, to keep it all going. And then if we realize that, you know, we look at that and we think, oh my God, you know, how did I get here? Um, and then there comes this motivation of, well, how, how can I disentangle from this? How can I start to uh, let it unravel? Uh, because you start to get the sense of the relentlessness and the endlessness of it. Mm. Do I really want to keep doing this? Uh, and the resounding answer is no, I don't. So this is where we start to explore how to disentangle uh, and expand uh, and to eventually uh, release and let go. 
I was thinking uh, a couple of nights ago in Lung Pa giving a talk and and uh, the various themes, a couple of the themes uh, that he kept on uh, iterating were, were uh, looking at stillness and uh, clear seeing, stillness and clear seeing. And um, was uh, really appreciating that and reflecting on that and uh, how those two qualities, attending to stillness and attending to, to clarity, clear seeing, are the basis for our release from this, uh, this self-view, uh, this complication of our experience. And interestingly, the obstructions, I was thinking about this, the, uh, the obstructions to both uh, clear seeing, um, if, you, if you want to call that um, vija, say avija being ignorance, uh, the nutriments to, to, uh, that keep uh, avija in operation are the five hindrances. Uh, and the Obstructions to stillness, to experiencing stillness and composure of the mind. The obstructions are also the five hindrances. So that's a starting point for our development of uh, the ability to return to stillness and also to see clearly. It's it's, uh, working with these five hindrance uh, patterns uh, and how the protective meditations um, are really addressing those um, those uh, five hindrances, like the kindness is an antidote for for uh, ill will, um, Buddhanicity is an antidote for doubt, uh, um, asuba is an antidote for the uh, sense desire. Um, and uh, marana sati, uh, death contemplation, uh, as an antidote um, for, uh, uh, say, um, uh, sloth and torpor, you know, dullness, drowsiness, it wakes us up. And I think I wasn't here for it, but Ajahn Lung Paul was talking about using um, the contemplation anapanasati, and, and, and that is a an additional reflection that helps uh, uh, as an antidote for uh, restlessness. So we've got these meditations, these contemplations as ways of helping to remove the obstructions to to knowing stillness and to turning the attention to stillness. And once we've kind of developed these uh, understandings, developed these meditations, then we can dwell in, in a mind that's uh, at least temporarily relieved uh, from these hindrances and, and how we can turn our attention to the quality of stillness and just uh, observing uh, with uh, unwavering composure but with also that clarity of, of, uh, of vijja, of clear seeing, of knowing, clear knowing, unobstructed because we've denourished the hindrances that support it. So we start to look with stillness at just what's happening, what's arising right here in this very moment. And not clinging to it, not holding to it, not holding to anything as it arises. It's just there. And it has its own life. All these things that we cling to that form a sense of of me and mine, um, we can release around them. It's like uh, that wonderful, very uh, short comment, the very uh, comment of the Buddhas, but uh, the development of uh, samadhi with release as its object. So we develop the stillness and the collectedness, the composure of mind with the purpose of release. And with that clarity of seeing, 
um, uh, then we just don't grasp, we don't cling to the objects. Uh, we don't need to uh, because uh, we don't have the need for that dependency on, on holding it all together. When we see that really all that arises is just dukkha arising, all that ceases is just dukkha ceasing, then there's no need to hold on to it. So just to keep turning our attention back to that, that clarity, that knowing quality, that awareness, awareness itself, the way it is, and to um, start to see how we don't need to get pulled into whatever it is that's arising. Uh, we can just stay with the knowing quality and uh, kind of realizing that fundamental insight that Ajahn Chah had with uh, his time with Ajahn Mun of the separation of the mind from the mind object, the knowing uh, from the objects of mind, that the, the still flowing water, uh, the, uh, the stillness that's always there at the basis, even with all the constituents of mind flowing through it, all the activities flowing through there's the mind, and then there's the objects. It's like a se the separation of oil and water. And with that as our, our reference point, uh, just returning to that stillness and that knowing and that non-grasping, that's where the sense of self really, really starts to fade. But in the meantime, we use you know, uh, an expanded state of mind, so as a constructive, fabricated state of mind of loving kindness uh, or other qualities that expand uh, our perception of, of self uh, until we don't need to have even an expanded perception of self. We're able to just release, relinquish, uh, let go, uh, and just uh, see the world and our experience as it is. And we don't need that false sense of security. Uh, and once we perfect that and do that uh, with everything that arises, then that's, I think that's real freedom. That's the true, that's the true freedom that we're all looking for. So anyway, that's, uh, I think, enough for this evening and, and um, just a few reflections for people to, to take with them if they if they wish to do so.